very recently, uh, we put in a bid uh, to essentially establish a new campus for the university. Uh, and more than the campus, an opportunity to improve the skills and the opportunities in the digital sphere and beyond the digital sphere for this region. And this ended up being successful. Millions of pounds have been awarded to the university. And we are going to have a little mini campus over in Adastral Park where BT and various other companies um, hang out and do these sort of things. Um, there's various slides that my boss provided on this, which, you know, interesting up to the point. Uh, for those who actually have to plan the thing, I'll be another of the, of the good jobs, but more usefully for people in the region, okay, so this mini campus is not just about you ship some students around, they, learn, they, they attend some lectures, they have some practicals, all being well, they get a degree and they go off and do useful things. It's about new companies, it's about new innovations, it's about CPD, it's about creating an environment where innovation, hopefully without the sins, will happen. And from the perspective of this group, there's a number of interesting laboratories that we were intending to establish, including aspects of sustainability and smart communities, smart ecology, all things that uh, hopefully will advance the University of Suffolk's agenda in developing things in this area. Um, because I'm mindful of the time, and I'm mindful that I stand between you and the coffee break, I'm not going to take too much of your time. Well, I'm going to throw some strange curveballs at you. Okay? I, um, you, know, you, as sustainability professionals, are already broken out of the of many silos that you could have been forced into. You already cross disciplines, you have to. Because of the, the nature of the research, the nature of the development, the nature of the industry you find yourselves in. So I'm going to throw some more curveballs from some of the things that we are doing, just to give you other things you might wish to be concerned about, might wish to worry about when you're taking forward innovations. So I'm leading, as the University of Suffolk PI, a project called Connected Together. Its aim is, can we use digital technology, tablets, apps, etc., to combat, to thwart social iso isolation? Can we use these technologies to help councils essentially cut their budgets on the health and social care because they'd be able to keep people in their homes for longer? And one of the findings <coughs> of this is actually, it's really quite hard for certain age groups to make use of technology. We're finding umpteen reasons why people can't use the tablet, can't use the app. So if you're thinking that, okay, maybe we'll have smart meters, maybe we will convince the general public to do things via apps that will make their lives more sustainable, you need to consider how you're actually going to make those apps, make those services usable by a large uh, contingent of the population. Because, trust me, we've, we've had many, many reasons why I can't do this. This is not for me. My lifestyle doesn't support this, etc., etc. And even simple things with tablets, you might not think about, you know, somebody's got arthritis, mm. etc. How can they hold the tablet to see how you know how much energy that the app will tell them they've been using? Very very simple things have to be you know, slapped down and sorted out. Another strange curveball. Okay, people in software these days use lots and lots of libraries and frameworks and stuff. You don't write all the code yourself. Fair enough. Wonderful. So, one of my students is, realizes that in the same way that you say the built environment, oh, we'll pick on something because someone else has used it, or I've heard about it. Software engineers do the same thing. They go, oh, I've heard about this framework. I've played with it. Yeah, I'll bring it in. I'll use it in this project. Now, that's all well and good. But the objective evidence that people are making those choices on 
is slim, very slim. So Frank, one of my PhD students, has done a little bit of research. Now, these tables, they mean very little to you, but all of you use the web. All of you go to websites, all of you go to websites where that website will start to personalise itself to you. It'll know your name, okay? And in order to do that, it grabs stuff from the database, it shovels the, the things together, it generates a web page that's particular to you. And it has to run a script to do that. And there's many, many different scripts that do this thing, okay? Random names that you don't care about. There are random tasks that they have to do, and again, you don't care about them. <laughs> What do you care about on this slide? You care about that the numbers are very different. That some of those numbers are really quite tiny in terms of the amount of time, the amount of computational cycles it takes to get stuff done. Whereas other things, for doing the same really quite simple task, let's be honest about this, are orders of magnitude, multiple orders of magnitude more. So if you're an e-commerce retailer, Actually, this means that your web pages are taking much longer to appear. And there's studies that say that if you can speed up your website by a second, you're going to hold more customers for longer. But if you think of this in a sustainability point of view, the fact that you need, okay, that's order 10, that's order 30,000, we're talking <laughs> a thousand times more computation, that's a thousand times more energy essentially being burned. And we already know that you know, blockchain has some good things about it, but look at how much energy is being wasted for Bitcoin mining. Achieving nothing. Okay? And lots of software is essentially burning energy. Burning energy for no good reason. So, that, so if you're an e-commerce retailer or somebody else who actually depends on your website, your customers are going away because it takes longer for the things to come up. And you are paying a price. The environment's paying a price, and you're paying a price because you probably put this in the cloud, and on the cloud, they charge you five minutes a millisecond. Okay? So, you think a software solution would be a good thing? Have some concern for the efficiency of how you're implementing it. Another auditing. Okay? Everything we do depends on software. Everything we do, because it depends on software, will have cybersecurity implications to it. Okay. So one of my uh, researchers is very interested in, okay, you want to do something. You want to get to the requirement stage. What are all the implications that need to be brought together to actually come up with good requirements that you can go forward with. Um, this is work she's taking it in action research with ARM to worry about, okay, how do you protect your physical supply chain and your information supply chain that lives with this? And all of you in the built environment have both of those in one way or another. Finally, some other odds and ends. Okay. Now a researcher working on cybersecurity stances. Cybersecurity is not something that's just for Christmas. You don't just sit down, come up with a cybersecurity policy, and all's well with your universe forever in the day. Sadly, the bad guys change their attack modes. They come up with new and exciting ways to do you over, therefore you have to evolve in response. And let's put it this way: a system that is not secure will not be safe will not be resilient. I have a number of projects, one PhD, two others in the KTP space, where we're looking at various aspects of software testing. And this is, again, some software testing that software developers do. It's easy. Okay? They can test small chunks of code, and it works or it doesn't work, and they fix the bugs. And all's well with, with their little world. When you try to scale up, when you try to worry about systems talking to systems, when you're in a world of systems of systems, suddenly you can't think of easy ways of testing that. Now, you might say, well, things mostly work. 
Yeah, they do mostly work until you discover that tiny errors that don't get caught by normal conventional software testing, well, there's uh, been one financial trading company that lost 500 million and went out of business the next day. Uh, Provident, who uh, essentially loans company, managed for again a small set of errors that just propagated through their system <coughs> to lose a billion and the share price has never recovered. And you might say, okay, those are one of the financial companies, I, we don't really care. You know, the bankers had it coming. If you could say that, but the same sorts of unexpected problems are unfortunately the same sorts of unexpected problems that lead to the Uber self-driving car killing someone. Okay? They're the same sorts of unexpected problems, even though engineers are sort of you know, complaining at their management, that lead to Boeing's planes coming out of the sky and landing and killing hundreds of people. So we've got some very exciting research into finding better ways of testing software where it's not just a tiny bits of code. It's large chunks of code that has to talk to other bits of code uh, in ways that you do not expect, in emergent ways, and trying to determine if they're behaving in the right way. And a final project in the sort of stuff that's happening here, um, we had joined forces with uh, Suffolk County Council, so their, their highways group, and a, a, a number of uh, other companies for a Department of Transport a funded project. It's the Live Lab Smarter Suffolk. Here we're going to be taking sensors to various places around the county and trying out stuff. Using them for air quality monitoring, for water monitoring, for determining can we actually save energy by being even more clever with how we light the streets and the roads of Suffolk. Because it turns out that, you know, actually, if you turn off the lights in certain places, you don't get burbled which was a surprise uh, to, to, to various people. So we're going to experiment further in that space. And a final project that is not on here, because actually you've already had a really fantastic presentation from him, is Peter Good's multi-dimensional framework analysis. Uh, he doesn't need to, uh, to, to get a single line here when, when you've already heard really good stuff from him. So that's the, the bizarre ranting from me. And I hope I've given enough time for coffee to be ready, <coughs> but not enough time to delay from it. <laughs>